last but not least, we have Michael Gastager, who will talk about machine learning for molecular spectra and solvent effects. Yeah, now you can hear me. So I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the chance to speak. And as all is already um, said, I, I will talk about a little bit of the, re the research we are doing in the Tuberlin group. Um, so the idea behind all our machine learning potentials and several extremely impressive applications you already say today, uh, saw today is that we have um, some efficient potentials to perform simulations with. So for example, you want them to sample some free energy surfaces, or you might even wish to simulate um, uh, vibrational spectra like infrared spectra. And uh, one problem you frequently encounter, or I would not say a problem, I would say a situation, is that you're not dealing with a single molecule in a vacuum, but that you're and instead dealing with a system that's surrounded by an entire environment. And there are several machine learning approaches to deal with larger and larger collections of atoms. Um, also the, the efficiency is improving quite significantly. But uh, what I want to talk to, about today is to, um, to think about this in a different manner. So that instead of modeling the whole system with machine learning, you have your, your part of the system you're interested in, which you need to describe very accurately. And you have some kind of environment surrounding the system, which, which couples to the machine learning component. And one way we, to think about this, so the in, initial inspiration was um, to have some kind of external field, which influences your molecule, which polarizes your molecule. But it turns out you can formulate this in a little bit more general method matter oh manner by basically making the field a function of the of the atoms in the environment and now how can i couple this so usually if you have properties like energies and um, you can get away with um, basically um, invariant architectures because you rotate your molecule the energy doesn't change but if you want to couple your system to the environment uh, that's not true anymore because you have a 3d um, arrangement of atoms or maybe a field in a certain direction applied to the molecule so if you rotate your molecule in most cases the energy will change and um I, I, I don't think I will surprise anyone. So how we solve this is by using equivariant features, which we also already saw multiple times today. So what we started with was um, the initial idea that we have Schnett, where you basically have a message passing network, which um, uses exclusively scalar features, so L0 features. And you can think of this as some kind of atomic charges interacting in your, as a coupling in your machine learning model. And um, since this was before Christoph developed BAME, um, we chose a different approach to introduce this, this um, equivariant features. Once again, inside by classical um, electrostatics is that we said we, in addition to the charges, we introduced something akin to atomic dipole moments. You can uh, build these atomic dipole moments in a local frame, you can update them. And uh, basically what you end up with is a feature representation which in includes these effects. But most importantly, um, it's, you, can have, you have a nice physical analog on how to couple to external fields because uh, classically, but also quantum mechanics, um, you describe the coupling with a vector field basically by taking the, the, dot, pro the dot product between the table moment and the vector field. So first order. And we found that 
really using this simple Im Im expression and adding it to the message passing update makes it possible to really couple to um, arbitrary external fields. So what we end up with is then, um, I've summarized it here, and function of, the, of everything. So basically of your thermic charges, of your positions, but also of your external fields. And um, with a little bit of tricking, you can even make it a function of these initial Dibble moments. I will show you why this is nice now, because um, in this way, we can actually let's say we have a, a nice side effect in addition to modeling environments. And this is, uh, we can build a model to depend, as I said, on, let's say, for example, nuclear positions, electric field, magnetic field, and the nuclear magnetic moment. So this would be the table features for coupling with the magnetic field. And why would I want to do this? Well, I can apply then a response formulism. So basically, by taking the appropriate derivatives, Starting only from an energy model, I can derive a large number of different properties. So most of you will be familiar with the forces as the first derivative of the energy. But in this manner, I can, for example, also get the Dibel moment um, by taking the first derivative with respect to electric field. Um, similar to polarizability tensor, I can also get nuclear magnetic shielding, nuclear spin-spin coupling out, but really just taking the derivatives. And one thing that's conceptually nice is you really start with the energy model. You have the equivariance in the interactions. And by taking these derivatives, you actually also get the correct equivariance for the properties you wish to model. So what I show here would be the um, three by three um, nuclear magnetic shielding tensor. And basically what you see here, this is, was a data set fit basically on one orientation of the molecule. So you've never seen the other orientations. And if you wrote it in, uh, in space, so along the X, Y axis, it, I think it was in this case, um, you basically, without needing any additional data to learn the rotational behavior of your properties, you can reproduce this perfectly. So this is also a nice case for having equivariance in your outputs. And of course, if I have all these properties, I can also use this method to simulate different kinds of spectra. So we have Dibble moments, we can um, simulate infrared spectra, also using bath integral molecular dynamics. With the polarizabilities, you have access to uh, Raman spectra. Um, since we have the full tensor, we can describe polarized and depolarized Raman spectra. And um, we also can um, look at the nuclear magnetic shift. So for example, here I have the uh, proton NMR and the 13C NMR chemical shifts from ethanol. It's not too exciting, but it's conceptually nice because as I said, this is just, you start with an energy model, you take the derivatives, um, you of course would include these properties in the, in the loss function and you obtain um, a nice description of all these quantities. Of course, but uh, that's uh, something of a tangent because what we set up out uh, was to model environments. And there also we found that uh, thinking of this as fields is a very nice, um, nice formalism because you then can go to literature. And then for example, you can say, yeah, well, um, I could actually also do something like um, implicit environments using this old reaction field mechanism, the Onsager, where I say I don't have, um, um, explicit atoms, but I have continuum surrounding my molecule. My field is then generated by this expression. Um, what we learn here is this volume factor. So that's something like a latent um, um, correction that we are not just a single sphere. And when we apply this to a quantum chemistry data uh, constructing with a BS BCM model, we can first of all see that we can fit this uh, polarizable continuum data quite well. And um, also quite surprisingly, um, you see here two data sets, uh, which are basically, um, which have a star. And this means, uh, sorry, I should, should say something, that's always ethanol in different polarizable continuum solvents. And the data sets with the star are basically continuum solvents that have not been included in the training data. So what you see here, just using this uh, basic physically sensible description is you can actually interpolate between different um, dielectric constants for your continuum solvent. 
but um, we can also make everything explicit in a manner that can be interesting for simulations. Um, uh, building on this basic concept in simulations where you have uh, you partition your system in the QM part with high accuracy, molecular mechanics part with reduced accuracy. And uh, in this QMM approach, what you usually do is, for example, if you um, do electrostatic coupling, you um, take the charges in the environment, the charges polarize your um, quantum mechanical region, and then you compute some kind of explicit electrostatic interaction between both regions. Turns out we can use FieldNet out of the box to do something very similar. In this case, we say our machine learning region is polarized by the external field of our MM charges. And um, we do not have explicit expressions for the charges for FieldNet, but um, response theory comes to rescue again because um, you can make a charge analysis where you take the derivative of the Dibble moment with respect to the nuclear positions. And we can then use this to fully couple our QMMM system. And here, just show you um, a quick test case where it's sometimes nice to have explicit environments. So what you see here is basically um, an uh, MD simulation computing the infrared spectra of ethanol um, in vacuum and with a continuum solvent. And if you compare this to the ethanol spectrum in, um, so in, so in neat ethanol, you see there is a quite a discrepancy, especially in the big shapes. So with the continuum solvent, I would say this OH vibration is much too, too, too narrow. And now we can go, we can actually add the explicit solvent. We say the big change, uh, the big shape now changes, it broadens what you would expect experimentally. And we also see that this is due to the hydrogen bonds forming between the, um, the ethanol hydroxyl groups. So this was one example why it sometimes can be nice to include um, external effects in an implicit man uh, explicit manner. And um, what, uh, what's for me also very interesting is we found, we uh, uh, looked for a second application and there are these Gleisen rearrangement reactions where you basically, you, you change the, the position of the carbon double bonds. And it turns out these Gleisen rearrangement reactions, so this of this allyl p to lulator in particular, they get accelerated if you perform it in an aqueous environment. So if you put it in water, the reaction um, proceeds significantly faster. But um, quantum chemistry studies uh, using continuum models couldn't find any reason for this acceleration. So what we did is we basically uh, trained a future model for this system in this um, MLMM setup. And what you can see here in blue and in red are um, simul umbrella simulations for the free energy barrier once for the system in vacuum and once for the system embedded in water in this MLMM manner. So where we treat the water molecules surrounding everything classically and we perform the umbrella sampling along the reaction coordinate. And what we found is you actually really have a lowering of the reaction barrier in the aqueous solution. It, it doesn't look much, it's approximately four kcal per mole, but this agrees nicely with the acceleration you find in experiment. And here, once again, we saw that um, explicit interactions between here, in this case, the transition state and your environment and our environment is responsible for this lowering of the uh, activation barrier. So we see hydrogen bonds um, stabilizing the transition state of the gas and rearrangement. So we, we can describe the systems and we can also use the other qualities of FieldNet. So we can, for example, monitor the uh, carbon NMR shifts, how they change during the reaction, where you see that uh, basically some of the peaks exchange position as the carbon bond shifts along the molecule. And um, even more excitingly, we can also, let's say, um, reverse this whole process a little. So instead of saying, I have this reaction, I have this environment, how high is the barrier? We actually have an analytical function of everything. So we know how the, how the environment, in this case would be this classical field of point charges, interacts with a machine learning model. So what we can take is we take images of our molecule around the reaction coordinate, 
which let's say original would give us a barrier like this. And then we, we, uh, uh, we apply a field of point charges, which are equally distributed over space. So on a grid, and we optimize this grid to reduce the reaction barrier. So what we are looking for is we are looking for an environment, in this case, uh, uh, electric, that we are a charged environment, which gives us the lowest possible activation barrier of a reaction. And we can see here, um, applying this formulation, optimizing our reaction, we can really lower this activation barrier significantly. So it's approximately 20 kcal per mole. Of course, this is um, just some random distribution of charges. You see some certain effects like, um, in this case, this would be a negative charge, this would be the positive charge. You can see here a feature like this hydrogen bond stabilizing your transition state I showed you before, but um, you cannot do a lot of it. What we did to just give you a proof of concept, we translated this quick and dirty in arrangement of amino acids around this, uh, in a, around the reaction barrier, where we just say that the, the partial charges of the amino acids should be at the maximum of these distributions. Um, we then recomputed this with uh, quantum chemistry and we found while we of course didn't arrive at this very um, optimal barrier, we still found the lowering of the barrier really using the quantum chemical reference method. So you can think that if it were possible to translate this environment in also discharge distribution in a more sophisticated manner, it really designed the height of the barrier. Yeah. And um, with this, I would uh, thank you, like to thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. Questions. Oh. This is really cool. I've, I've, I've dreamt about doing the transition state uh, environment optimization. This is really neat. Uh, is there a paper out for this that we can go read? What's yes, the... um, there is a paper, so it, I have had the reference somewhere. Boop, 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 boop. I think it's this one. Yeah, like it's the chemical one, science. No? Yeah, it's this one, yeah. And then my actual question would be, so can you walk us through the mechanics of how this is trained? You train on gas phase molecules and molecular clusters. You train on PCM training data. What, what, what is the training data for so this? It, uh, basically for all the cases I would show you, I, you can use different training data. So for the gas phase, you would of course use gas phase data. Um, what we always did is we always computed these response properties because we also wanted to see how the model performs for them. The, the, the polarizable continuum model is, um, is trained on a PCM model. I think the PCM model implemented in Orca in this case. And uh, for, the, for the QMM model, um, we also use the Orca code package where you basically you take um, your snapshots where you sample some distribution of the molecules around the molecule uh, configuration you want to have. And then you use this in a computation with explicit external charges to get your reference data. Thank you. Uh, thanks for a nice talk. Um, I have a question. The spectra, they look really nice, but there was this one band in the um, 3,500 wave numbers, which are apparently comes from the water. Do you have an idea why you cannot really reproduce this one or why does it even? This one? Yeah, there is this the great experiment one, the solvent, right? I mean, it's- yeah. um, The thing is, I would say this are nuclear quantum effects. So okay. we will both, get, so this was done without ring volume and molecular dynamics because the QMM set on them is um, not nice. And um, I would expect that with uh, the ring volume dynamics, since this OH uh, vibration should also shift to lower regions, so lower frequencies. Oh. I mean, you see it here in, um, in this spectra, we are actually going from classical to ring volume and molecular yeah. dynamics, it's shifted, yeah. so it's redshift. So you would say in principle, it's learnable, it's not, it's not a systematic thing that it's, that cannot be catched by the, I, I would say it's not a systematic, 
I would assume it's not a, a systematic problem of the reference method or of the machine learning model, but how the system is si simulated. Yeah, okay. So we are most likely missing the nuclear problem effect. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks for the talk. It's super cool. Um, does it, is there ever a situation in which you may want to um, have a bit more structure on on defining the solvent like either you know instead of it being like a liquid like are there any situations in which you actually kind of want to uh, measure properties with sort of a polarized uh, solvent or something like that like that yeah, I mean if you want to to let's say you have a whole solvent box and you're in, interested in the um, let's say the the expectation values also so density uh, as so what we saw before is actually um you would of course okay. need to solve uh, um, simulate everything but if you're really interested in some most likely solvated reactions where you're not interested in the, uh, the properties of the whole system um this uh, still holds i mean what you could think of is that you basically um go a little bit crazy and um mm -hmm make all the water uh, so all the molecules in here independent machine learning regions which then couple via um, this this qmmm formalism so you would have don't say 5000 independent systems and um, then you would as so then you could actually recover the the properties of the whole system if you parameterize it right yeah i think i'm also thinking of like just uh things where you might have some sort of ensemble, but it's a very structured ensemble. Like, I don't think this is a good analogy, but like liquid crystal kind of, where you have more of a structured background, but I'm, I'm not yeah. sure if it makes sense for any of these applications, but yeah. I mean, you could also think of doing something like a solvent to start, that you that you induce some kind of fluctuation that's follow a certain structure, which emulates your solvent without having the solvent. Any more questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Michael and all the speakers in the session.